guys, come in, relax, take your shoes off, put your feet up, and get ready to listen to This Is Bodybuilding. My name is Daniel Lansfield, I'm your host, and this is Bodybuilding. It's a, it's a bodybuilding podcast, it's a life podcast, it's a journal, it's an entryway into the lives and the minds and the hearts and the souls of the people involved in the world of bodybuilding. This week, my guest is Wes Newell. Uh, for those who are in the know, Wes uh, gained a little bit of notoriety last week by uh, earning himself the nickname Mr. Arm- uh, the, was it? No, Mr. Brownlow and the Armour Guard Hulk. He was uh, the security guard on um, on footy, or he was yeah on the the Brownlow uh, coverage. He was there standing with the the votes. Um, he actually is a security guard. It wasn't a plant. He, he really is a security guard. Um, but he, you know, there's so much more to him. He, he's a WFF professional bodybuilder. He was a former chef. Um, I don't know. Look, we, we have a really great chat. Uh, so there's a lot. There's a lot more to this guy than than what I think he uh, he let out in the interview. And I'm sure I'm sure he'll probably listen to this. And Wes, if you are listening, you know, thanks for the for the chat, man. But um, you know, I have no doubt that, uh, there's a lot more that we could have probably talked about if we had, you know, another two or three hours. So this interview with Wes was actually recorded last, I think it was after, I'm trying to think, but yeah, this is the fifth recorded interview, uh, or podcast, but it's airing second because obviously with everything that happened, uh, last week around the Brownlow, um, I wanted to make sure that I, I, you know, I got this out in time so that people weren't sitting there going, "Hey, wait, who's this guy? What's he?" Um, I'm sure no one's ever going to do that. But um, you know, look, if you if you get onto Google and you type Wes Newell or Mister Brownlow or Armagard Hulk or, or whatever, you'll see a hell of a lot of stuff come up. Um, you know, he's really he's really been everywhere this week, um, and that's great. That's that's awesome exposure. But you know, I'm sure. He, you know, he says it a couple of times. He's not really one to live in the spotlight. So, uh, you know, I'm wondering, you know, whether he's going to truly go back to just being good old Wes, or is he is he going to try and uh, keep his keep his head in the in the spotlight a little bit longer? I'm not sure. Um, I'd like to see him do well. You know, I mean, like like all people in bodybuilding, I you know, I want to see bodybuilders succeed, and I want to see people having fun and and smiling and enjoying themselves. So. Yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully we see a little bit more of him. Yeah, as we go. So I've been talking to some of my buddies over in the UK who are doing, uh, and actually around Europe, who are doing the Nabi Pro Universe in October this year. And I tell you what, it is going to be a big, big show. Um, last year we had Jake Nicolopoulos from Australia go over. He was the first Australian Nabi professional on the Nabba Universe stage in something like 15 or 20 years. I think John Torelli or I think it was John Torelli was the last uh, the last professional Mr. Universe and he was a professional universe winner back in the 90s. Um, I believe Brian Buchanan might have come after him, but he was English and he was representing Australia and it was a bit confusing. But anyway, yeah, nearly 20 years has gone by since uh, Australians have been on the Nabba Universe professional stage this year we have two jake's going back i tell you what you know i saw him the other day he's he's looking bigger bigger and, and better than ever um even with his shirt on i didn't see him with his shirt off and uh jim cotton tonus is going over as well and i tell you what you know that that guy is jimmy is is just carved out of granite i've never seen him not in peak condition um you know if he brings one thing to the stage it's going to be freaky mass and freaky condition. He's, you know, the veins that pop out of this guy, you know, you just, it's incredible. It really is. Um, so that's going to be a big show and I'm looking forward to being over there again to see everyone. Um, and I'm, I'm going to hopefully talk to some people on the podcast um, while I'm over there. Uh, a couple of the NABBA pros and hopefully some people from um, other countries. Uh, my buddy Doug Brignall is coming over from the U.S., a to Ireland uh, a little bit later on this year for the WFF World Championships, and I'm going to catch up with him there. So that's going to be really cool. Um, and you know there'll be a few other people as well that I, I see uh, over there. So yeah, hopefully you know this is bodybuilding. It's not just this is Melbourne bodybuilding. It's this is bodybuilding worldwide. 
You've had a pretty big week. I've had a very big week, um, with the Brownlow being on Monday night. So you're now officially known as Mr. Brownlow. That's your <laughs> that's your nickname. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. I also get called the Army Guard Hulk. So um, what do you prefer? Ooh, I do like the Hulk. The Hulk. I do like the Hulk, but um, Mr. Brownlow, it's, it's very flattering. Um, I didn't expect such a a response. Um, initially, I did the Brownlow. I wanted to do it because. Um, I'm very enthusiastic about football. I wanted to see all the players and stuff like that. Mm. And then, um, actually, I drew a lot of attention, and um, it's been a lot of fun. So, what were we saying? You, you drew a lot of attention. You've been on. I think we were looking. The, the guys out in the um, reception today were looking at the. Um, they googled you. Mm. <laughs> I think you came up on like Channel Nine, the, a bunch of local newspapers, Channel Seven, Channel Ten. Um, basically, I think all like yeah, everything connected to Fairfax. Um, and all that is just, it's gone crazy. And, the, and there's been a few videos made of you as well. And you did an interview with... Uh, Big Review TV yeah. and The Age newspaper as well. Um, and they were really great guys and um, they were interested in what I was doing externally, you know, outside yeah. of bodybuilding also. Yeah. Um, and they actually filmed me training and uh, okay. yeah, it was quite nice. And they sort of suggested that I... Um, I'd be the, the Bachelor on 2017, you know? Hey, that could be a... Although, I don't know, I mean... <laughs> I'm not sure whether you get in trouble for doing that. You got... Uh, yeah. But... <laughs> you might get in trouble, I don't know. You could get in trouble. Yeah. But, oh, look, you know, troubles, trouble follows people wherever they go, I suppose. That's right. <laughs> you can't always escape it. But, um, I don't know, is that something you consider? Like, is that... Is TV a thing that you've been interested in well, actually, getting involved in, or is it sort of... I'm, I'm actually pretty camera shy, to be honest, but um, when it's over, like when we've done some of these um, little videos and stuff, I actually mm. got a bit of a thrill out of it. And I thought, you know, it's not so bad, it's not so hard. A little mm. bit like when you compete for the first time, you're very nervous and anxious yeah. and, and quite stressed about it, but then it becomes a little bit addictive and you just want to get back out there again and do it again. Well, so, especially, yeah, once you've done it a few times, it gets... Yeah get used to it. Right, well, talking about competing then, take us back to when was your first contest? Well, the first contest was in 2004 and it was with the Muscle Mania Australia and uh, I was fortunate enough to win that show and I was uh, hooked after that. I actually competed in a couple of different federations, the IMBA also, mm. and went to the, uh, the US and competed yep. in the Natural Olympia in cool. Las Vegas. What year was that? Uh, that was in 2004. Okay. And I actually quite a while ago. managed to win that one as well. Wow. So... Uh, you know, when I got the saw the opportunity to travel, um, I was kind of hooked. Mm. You know, um, I think a lot of people don't take that opportunity. They just sort of they they go, oh yeah, we're going to do our local show here, or a you know the local pro qualify here for the next five or six years, mm -hmm. and they never take the opportunity to go and meet people overseas. And, and you know, it's like you go backstage overseas, and there's people from fifteen or twenty different countries, and suddenly you've got. You know, if you want to go, you want to go travel the world. Suddenly, you've got friends in fifteen countries. That's true, um, and all of my experiences overseas have been amazing. And um, I just want to do it for as long as possible. To be honest with you, um, it's actually more about the travel than it is about the show. Sometimes I'm just yeah. ready to party afterwards. You know, <laughs> um, uh, it's a it's a good excuse to get overseas and, and get out there and see the world. Yeah, and you know what? Like you always make some amazing friends too mm. when you get over there, and I've done it every time. So. I feel very privileged and very fortunate to have those experiences. Um, obviously, with the the WFF, uh, that presents an opportunity to travel every year. Yeah. And since turning uh, pro in March, you just um, go straight overseas. It's pretty yeah, easy. Yeah, every show is international. Well, you did, so you, you, I mean, you came with us to Orlando, and you were with us in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's probably a bit of a different sort of feeling. You, Orlando, Mr. Universe, yeah, that's yeah. a pretty big, uh, pretty big stage. And that's true. That was, um, yeah, it was a pretty wild ride over there, I guess. Yeah, and a couple of years ago, we went to, about three years ago, I think, we were in Austria as well. Yeah, that's right. At the yeah. universe, so that was, that was awesome experience as well. And like I said, you get to meet some of the greatest people, so I've yeah. um, really enjoyed. Have you, uh, have you ever met anyone overseas that you looked up to? Have you ever met any of your idols while traveling? Yeah, um, when I was over in California, and obviously everybody goes to Gold's Gym, yeah. you know, I saw Lou Ferrigno there. Oh, wow. And, um, and who, who else? Um, what was that guy? Gunter? Is that? Gunter Schleerkamp. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He, was, he was in the, the fire, uh, the, the firehouse cafe yeah. or something, and he's oh. having his uh, egg whites and brown rice or something. Is he still big? 
Um, he, he was a he was a massive bloke. Yeah, well, I saw him when he was big and he was still yeah. competing. So that was probably back in 2004, now yeah. that I think about it. Um, but they're the main two. But yeah. And in Australia, sometimes they come over, don't they, as well, yeah. and we get to see them when they do their when, So when did you meet When did you meet Lou Ferrigno? That was in 2004. Okay. So now, him. like, uh, reportedly he's one of the, the nicer personality, I guess because he's not competing anymore, but yeah, he's always been known to be quite a humble sort of person and he's very friendly. And yeah. Did you find him that way? Um... <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Um, his thing is that we actually interrupted him while he was training. And oh, okay. um, I think that he just like, I'll talk to you later. Yeah. And I also think that, you know, because, you know, he's a little bit hard of hearing too. Yeah. I think that he was just, he sounded abrupt when he spoke, but yeah. I don't think it was intentional. Okay. Um, but, you know, I didn't change my opinion of him. I still, yeah. you know, vitalized him since I was a kid. So, yeah. Who do you, I mean, I guess you've been competing for a long time now. About 12 years. 12 yeah. years. So, it's kind of, I don't know if it's redundant to say, who do you look up to in bodybuilding in terms of today's standard? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people looking at you going, geez, I want to look like that. Especially after Monday, there's uh, probably thousands and thousands more people going, geez, I want to look like this bloke. Yeah, well, um, I mean, you can't dispute like the top guys like Phil Heath and Kyra Green. I mean, they've got unique personalities as well, which, you know, um, draw your interest towards them. Um, I'm not the, the typical like bodybuilding enthusiast. Um, you know, I don't follow everybody and and stuff. I actually just like the science, the so you, goal setting. You don't sit there and get into debates about who had the best lats at the last IFBB Pro Show and all this sort of crap on no, Facebook. Not at all. Not at all. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I just I, you know it's funny. I just really just more concerned with myself to be honest and making my own uh, <laughs> uh, improvements. Um, well, okay. So outside of bodybuilding, mm-hmm. you've obviously got security you work for Armagard work for Armagard that's true is that yeah. that's your full time gig or you got it is my full time job um, I've done a few other little things like I help a, a good friend of mine at Aaron and um, he has like Melbourne Transformers and um, is that do you guys dress as Transformers and go to birthday parties we do that's I've correct s- I've seen that on Facebook that looks hilarious yeah it's good fun and just some charity work as well it. yeah well you know especially like go to the Royal Children's Hospital or something yeah. like that it's, um, it's always nice to do charity for people mm. Um, so that's something that's um, le- not so frequent for me these days. I'm sort of busy with other things, and especially like this year when I was, um, I did like six shows in uh, seven months thereabouts. Jeez. So my weekends were pretty much consumed with um, bodybuilding and dieting. Yeah, and resting, <laughs> yeah. resting 20 hours a day. <laughs> but um, so that's how, been. How fun. do you stop yourself from going, going stir crazy when you prep? I mean, you do six, six shows in seven months, that's basically no off time yeah and it's I guess it's one thing to diet for six months and do a show yeah. it's a different thing you obviously would have been dieting coming into that first show and then it's another seven months of or six months of just non-stop show prep so what's your well I actually enjoy the process and um, and um, I do actually um, I actually enjoy the suffering to be honest and going without um, I always say application is my only skill and um, this is probably the the biggest interest I have. Yeah. And I think, well, you know, your pride's on the line here. Just stay, you know, true to yourself and think about... I never put, like, short-term happiness in way of my long-term goals. And okay. I wanted to make the most of um, this pro card as well, because I'm 38 now, so I didn't want to... Uh... I don't think most people would believe you're 38. <laughs> well, that's nice. Right, thank you. Um yeah, so I mean, it's not actually that hard or not that challenging for me um, because I think I am a better person when I have a routine in yeah. place. I don't come home, I have to worry about what I'm eating for dinner. I know what it's going to be. It's, you know, chicken yeah. and broccoli, I guess, <laughs> or asparagus or, you know, whatever. I suppose when you've been doing it for 12 years, it gets that routine is almost something that you crave. And you say, yeah, you, you'd like to. Yeah. I mean, do you deny yourself uh, you know, the food that you want and other experiences because you've got a goal in bodybuilding in mind, or is it is there something so sort of deeper there? Do you? Well, you know, when you come off the diet, um, because I, I'm actually a foodie, and I think that um, if I wasn't so vain, um, <laughs> I would be a really large guy. You know, I think my true calling is probably pie-eating contests or something, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, the being that I used to be a chef, um, and I have this interest in food and um, and and like the finer things, um, you just have such a greater appreciation for it, 
appreciation for it when you've been away from it for such a long time. Yeah. So, you no, know, everyone sort of goes for you know the donuts and the ice cream and stuff like that. But I actually would plan ahead and book into a, a five star restaurant. I usually go to um, a bit well, of Kobe beef or something like that. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I booked into the Aria. Okay. Um, when did the uh, Nationals mm. and uh, Matt Moran's restaurant and had like a degustation menu? I think I spent six hundred dollars that Ooh. night. Just um, on yourself. <laughs> actually, I did have a, a girlfriend at the time. I took okay. her, um, but that's the sort of experiences I like to have. Yeah, you know, and um, so it's been good, and uh, and it's a reward for all your hard work and something to look forward to, and mm. it also helps keep you on track. I think. Yeah, you know? I suppose it's uh, you need that thing in your life to keep you grounded. And for a lot of people, bodybuilding is that that anchor point where, you know, relationships go all over the place and work can be up and down. But you've got the gym and you've got your diet and you know what you're doing. Is that sort of how it is for you? That you can... Yeah, I think because we're all we're all faced with adversity from time to time, and um, you know, these are the sort of things that actually inspire me as well as hearing people's stories of triumph and and certain things. But I mean, it's important that if you have a partner that can. Um, you know, support you in your decisions, but I think that. Well, you, well, you were with your ex for nine years. You said. Yeah, nine years. It's a, long, a long time. time. Yeah, um, so she didn't really enjoy it, but I always. Uh, well, she competed as well. She though, did I mean, compete. Yeah. yeah, she thought, "Well, you're doing it. I'm going to do it as well." So I think we got on the best when we were dieting together, and you'd think that actually you'd be punching on, but um, we weren't. And I used to do all the meals for her and all the meal prep and everything. So. Um, it was it was a good experience. Then together we can go and enjoy food together and appreciate it at the same level, you know. Um, so. But I mean, if your uh, if your bodybuilding goals, I mean, I, don't know, I guess, do do you ever sit there and think, all right, I'm 38, and I'm you know, you're not married, and do you ever sit there and think, geez, I really I would like to just love you know, love to settle down and and that, or, or are you enjoying life too much <laughs> to think about settling down it's, it's, a, it's not that actually an easy question that because um i think if i met the right person i would like to settle down but you know being uh, a single for the time being is i have been enjoying it to be honest um you know let's say you know for every year you're in a relationship you need at least one month to decompact that year yeah. So, I mean, I don't know, it's probably been... I'd agree with that. I've probably been two years. Um, oh, there you go. <laughs> so. <laughs> but I'm just starting to enjoy it now. Um, you know, cause well, you you're can... in your off-season. You can enjoy a little bit right now. That's right. Um, so, yeah, um, it's just good to just be able to do what you want when you want. And Yeah. I think a lot of people... It's interesting that you, you say that, like... Like being able to do what you want when you want, mm. even though you're dieting, mm. that's still that that's still your mentality. It's like, well, it's my choice. I'm, I'm I can do. Whereas a lot of people get into this mindset of, oh, I'm dieting. I can't do anything fun. I, and it's just all doom and gloom. Yeah. And you, you know, you sort of have a, a different approach that it's it's my it's my choice, and I'm making the choice, and this is what I want to do. Yeah. But also, um, you know, when I did have my girlfriend, like I wouldn't, um, you know. Put, push it on her too much like I know she, we still um, oh, how do I say it? like I would still take her out every week and take her out for lunches and mm. have you know do something active with her um, I wasn't one of those guys that needed to carry around his esky with his chicken and that kind of stuff <laughs> I mean there is a balance and you know if I indulge a little bit when, and it'd be, I'd be lying if I said I never slipped up on the diet and I would do it on purpose so that we can have a nice experience together mm. I would just get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and go do some cardio like <laughs> it wasn't such a big deal because I don't do cardio normally anyway and so oh, I've got to do one, one session of cardio I mean big deal so some people have to do it every day I don't so. are, you, are you just genetically lucky that way or do you just find that because you've been training so long your body's in a, in a routine that you can yeah, I mean, like, okay, you're in your off season, but you don't look like you're, no. you're blown out. So yeah, well, I'm 104 kilos at the moment, and I'm you, still way under 10. percent I've still got. You know, what's, my, what was your stage weight? 92 this year. Okay. Previously, so, I've come from about 81 kilos, but as okay. you learn more and your diet adjusts, um, yeah. I've been putting on more weight. Um, but yeah, it is, it is genetics for me because I've always had a very fast metabolism. I've always been a pretty skinny sort of kid yeah. and um it's sort of stuck with me um that's why i'm not overly big you yeah. know um so it's like i said it You're hasn't lucky not, yeah it's, it's not too it's not too hard for me not too hard for me you know so 
Um, I mean, it's not that I don't want to card. It's just that I don't have to do the cardio and those grueling yeah. stair climbers and things so like that. You know? An average workout for you in the gym, mm. an hour, two hours, four hours? What do you? Yeah, look, I do train instinctively. Um, I just have a job to do. I have in my mind before I get there what I like to do. Obviously, the basic science doesn't change, like with reps and sets and whether I'm choosing to have heavy days or... Um, you know, higher reps and things like that. Um, yeah, n- there was a time when I was training twice a day, um, but now just the once is enough. Probably one to two body parts per week. Um, I'm sorry, in a session yeah. per week. Um, you do back and tries and chest and biceps and that sort of stuff. Not story. even. If I'm going to do two muscles, it'll be biceps and triceps. Um, I won't even do my whole legs in one day. It'll be hamstrings and calves um, and quads on their own day. Yeah. Um, so and back on its own shoulders on their own chest on their own um yeah you find that gives you good results though well yeah i mean i've never had a coach or anything like that and i sort of just do what i think is right i wouldn't um i was gonna say for mm. a guy who's just doing what he thinks is right you're getting it a lot right <laughs> yeah <laughs> you, well it's you're, a, you're not missing the mark so <laughs> No, not. I mean, this year I think I slipped up a little bit. I was uh, getting a couple of second places and third places and stuff. But um, prior to that, I mean, I've done like thirty shows now, and, mm. and prior to this year, I virtually was undefeated. And um, and uh, so I think it, there's a little bit more to learn. Well, there's always something to learn. It's always yeah. evolving, yeah. and I'm always open to new ideas and stuff. Uh, fortunately for me, I actually one of my housemates. He's a um, he's, he's a doctor, and he has his PhD in. Um, the metabolism and stuff like that. So okay. if I have any questions, there's no accident that lives with me. Um, you know, he's also a bodybuilder, a very okay. good one at that. Who's your housemate? Sean Mason. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's a very nice, um, quiet guy. And he competes as well in the NAVA. Yeah. Um, like class four, I think. Okay. Yeah, he's been off for a couple of years, but yeah. um, he brings a good package. Mm. Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you find that that's a... Uh does he sit there and look at you sometimes and just shake his head like, what are you doing? Or I mean, I, I think, Two bodybuilders in the one house, obviously you know, there's going to be a bit of, not necessarily competition, but you know, if he's prepping and you're looking at him going, oh man, geez, you really... You know, or is he... Well, this is, the thing is, he sees me dieting and he sees all my Tupperwares in the fridge and uh, he's like, you know what, you're actually inspiring me and, uh, and he sees me changing, getting leaner. And I actually do um, like go to him and ask his opinion, like how am I looking? I'm, so I'm he's effectively today. your coach. Uh, you know Without what? Being you know your what? Coach, I, like, I, I yeah, probably, you know what? Yeah. Um, you know he keeps me on track because you know how like you, you know, your mind plays tricks on you, doesn't it? Yeah. And you think that you're not in shape and all sorts of different things. And um, he's walk, just walk like past just, the wrong mirror and suddenly you, mm. yeah, you, your mind. <laughs> he <laughs> doesn't um, want to agree. Fortunately, there was no rivalry because um, well, he's the NABA competitor yeah. Yeah. and I'm a WFF competitor, and. Um, Will never. Actually, if he turns pro in the WFF, oh, I have uh, to see, yeah. we'd probably meet on stage. You know, well, what's he, what does he compete at? What's, well, he's like? ninety kilos, Jesus. but he's very. Um, but he's class four, so it's yeah, under sh- short. It's class four, under one point six eight meters or something like that. So. Yeah, so, so he's, he's a unit, definitely. Jeez, that's um, yeah, that's that's very solid. Mm. Uh, yeah, he's got a big thick back and chest and stuff like that. So it looks good, and I'm more athletic. To looking more, uh, yeah. That's all right. Mm-hmm. So, how did you get involved in bodybuilding? Or right, involved, but how did, like, what what was the sort of uh, the the initial spark that gave you the interest? Was it flipping through a magazine and you saw the bodybuilders and thought, oh yeah, I want to look like that, or was it just a well, I remember an evolution like, from sports or something. Yeah, well, when I was um, obviously when I was very young, um, you know, I was. Uh, I always, always liked muscles and um, wanted to be strong and uh, there was TV action here as it inspired me. Um, and that's probably where it started off. I mean, you know, you had your Rocky films and uh, Rambo and then there was obviously Commando and all that sort of stuff. Things that I wouldn't really watch nowadays. Um, but they got me started, of course. And then um, I always suspected the girls like muscles too, so... yeah. Oh, curls of, get the girls that's what they say oh the curls get the girls well I've got those as well so curls and muscles and what else money so uh, yeah. um, now I was going to say your uh, your signature hair has been snipped off 
Yeah. You used to have the the man bun or the the ponytail and that. Yeah, I did. When did you when did you get a haircut? It was just before, like a, probably a week before I went to uh, New Zealand um, okay. for the uh, Pan Pacifics. Pan yeah. Pacifics, and uh, I thought, you know what, uh, fresh new look for spring, yeah. also, <laughs> and uh, it, you know what, like you've had, you've had long hair for a long time, though. Yeah, it's been off and on. Like I had it long hair back in two thousand four yeah. and grew it, and uh, thing is, you get attached to it. Like you just really, it took you so long to grow. You don't want to cut it off. Then I cut it off, and then I thought, you know what, I just really want long hair again. And I was actually, um, because I tore my bicep actually um, a couple of years ago, moving some furniture, and um, I was sitting at home, and I got to watch Game of Thrones, and I saw that Jon Snow, and he had this long hair, and I thought, you know what, I want to look like that dude. So did you have um, facial hair though? I did grow a beard for a little bit. um, I I think I remember seeing you with a beard a while ago. How long ago was that? Um, well, it's off and on. It doesn't take them long to grow one, to be honest. What's um, your renewal? What's your what's your heritage? Um, well, I'm half English, half Scottish. So yeah, the English renewal is English. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. My my background's like Irish and I don't know English and other bits and pieces thrown in there. And I have a I don't know, I have a, I have a difficult time growing a full beard really yeah. really quickly and easily. But then I guess you got ten years on me. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe when. Uh, yeah, I know, although I see Dad, if Dad doesn't shave for two or three days, he gets all well, that whole salt and pepper oh, yeah. thing going on. It looks really, it looks really weird because he's had he's been clean shaven since he popped out of the womb. I think. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. Actually, bit. mine, mine actually, I've got really dark hair on my head, but then my beard's ginger, and uh, oh, right. I'm probably going to have like a bit of green there now too. So it's just going to stay clean shaven for me. I think from this, from now on, you don't. Uh, wouldn't go the dirty porno mustache or anything like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I do actually cut them in when I'm sh- having a shave and have a look at them, but I never would walk out of the bathroom with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, what, what else outside of bodybuilding really gets you fired up? You know, I like motorbikes, and uh, I have the, the new Triumph Speed Triple R. And uh, that's probably my favourite possession at the moment. So I look forward to jumping on that every day. I ride in the all weather, so um, it's the only way to travel. It doesn't scare the shit out of you when you ride in the rain. Um, I nearly, I nearly had an accident the other night. I was going through a red, or well, not a red light. I was going through a, an intersection. The light went amber, and I was halfway through. And a motorbike that was waiting to turn pulled out in front of me, and I had to dart around it. And the, the motorbike was beeping at me. Right. I thought, Jesus, like it's, I wouldn't want to be on a bike in the rain. Like, because the, the visibility was very bad, even in the car, it was pretty scary. So I mean, I yeah. can't imagine it'd be. Well, look, I mean, I've had it. I've had it been in, involved in a couple of accidents, as a matter of fact. Um, but it hasn't sort of deterred me. Serious uh, accidents? Yeah, uh, there was one pretty bad. It was about five weeks before um, the international, yeah. um, and I uh, someone was making a, a left hand turn from the right hand lane, and I hit him at full speed and um, I wasn't wearing any uh, protection because it yeah. was a kind of a warm day yeah. and um, it's been flying across the road oh, it was on Brunswick Road and um, you got any scars from it? yeah I do actually um, I've got a nice tattoo on my leg from uh, where they were had to use a wire brush to scrub the gravel out of it um, it's been with the ambulance turned Jeez. up and they were like how attached are these pants you know and they just, they just cut them straight off me and uh, and they have this this special um like uh, pain relief that they squirt up your nose, and I remember the ambulance. The cocaine, or I don't know. It was <laughs> it was pretty good. I know that all the paramedics have been stealing it apparently because it's so oh good. But um, they actually said, "How much should we give him?" And one of the ladies goes, "All of it." <laughs> they, they thought that it'd be, they thought that it had been burnt, as a matter oh, of fact. God. And uh, I tell you what, it was the best feeling when they squirted that stuff up my nose. But uh, anyway, I ended up still competing. I only trained my legs about five times. For that prep, actually, and uh, he came second to Matt Jones in the okay, uh, yeah. class uh, two, yeah. and so um, we just put some tan over it. Yeah. Who cares? You know, it wasn't even healed; it was still wet. And we just put tan, put some uh, contest color over the top of it, and then a bit of uh, didn't that sting? Uh, yeah, Fuck. that's probably why I've got a tattoo there because oh, um, of the tan. Is it is it the, the, the skin? No, it's not like stained brown or anything underneath. No, it's just. Yeah, you don't, you don't really see it to be honest. You just, oh, oh yeah, I was, I've never noticed it. Yeah, it's just around the knee, the kneecap, but it's sort of right between 
some insertions with muscles, and so you just yeah. you just blends in. You can't see it. So you know. Were you in hospital for any length of time? Yeah, I was in bed for like two weeks, and uh, unfortunately, what happens when you can't move? Um, we ended up getting really sore back too, and I had some bulging yeah. discs, and I just had a whole catalog of problems. And then, um, yeah, but like I said, um, you know, I, I can I feed off that sort of stuff. I'm like, you know what, I'm not going to be You're sick. Down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're I'll just, I'm you're gonna, a sick I'm, man. I'm still going to get up and do it. And, you know, if I, I thought to myself, <laughs> if I stay on my diet, if I just keep eating my chicken and my yeah. lettuce and stuff, I'm just going to, I'll still make it. Yeah. I never, don't count me out until yeah. uh, the very last minute. Once I put my mind to something, it's, um, you know, I'll see it through. You ever worry that, like, you've got, I don't know, the, I don't know how to put how to put this. Do you, you, you ever worry that you're like, all right, you know, I want to push things to the extreme so much that you might end up doing something silly, that you might hurt yourself, or not necessarily like on a, on a motorbike or something, but you know, you're saying you, know, you, you like depriving yourself and that. And I don't know like, you know, historically bodybuilders will do something really far out, like try and drop ten kilos in a week to make weight or something crazy like that is it ever sort of crossed your mind that you know you like that spartan lifestyle so much that you might just go fuck it i'm just gonna not eat for a, for two days and just do something you know the only time i haven't eaten for a couple of days didn't eat or drink was when um my scales were wrong and uh <laughs> and i thought i was like the weight i wanted to be at and and then you know, i come for the weigh-in and they're like no nah, no nah, you're about six kilos over so um you know, you do some extreme stuff with saunas and things like that then, but normally I'm very calculated and um, I keep myself close mm. all year round. And uh, so um, I guess no. So you do Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I do work hard. Um, and like I said, I do like enjoy the, the, the process um, and the deprivation. Um, you, th- you thrive on the discipline more than yeah. the pain. Yeah. Yeah, I do. It's, uh, after a while, you get used to it anyway. And um, when you start eating other things, yeah. you actually don't feel very well. So, um, you know, you, yeah, that's get, true. you actually want to get back on the diet as soon as possible. So the other thing is, like, I always um, perform better when I'm facing adversity, if I have problems. Yeah. Um, I like to... You like the uphill battle. Yeah, because I have, I have the ability to, like, harness all my emotions mm. negative positive and I can vent them into something positive mm. like training um, I do train on my own yep and uh, I don't like training partners I just get in the zone and um, yeah and just think about you know why I'm here and um, and I've got a job to do and just get it done fair enough so I mean all right, this week you've had a lot of uh, you said you had a lot of friend requests on Facebook and <laughs> yeah and Instagram you know, grew as well Instagram yeah. so <laughs> What's what's been the biggest learning curve out of this week for you? Obviously, yeah, Monday night everything just exploded on social media, yeah. Twitter and Facebook, and that went off. Um, mm. Was it? I mean, was it on the same night that people started recognizing you? Because obviously, as soon as I saw the photo, I knew it was you. Yeah. But there's probably a lot of people who didn't know who you were before Monday night that suddenly, I don't know, jumped on your bandwagon or. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's happened. Um, you got some offers for dates? I... <laughs> I've had offers for dates. Uh, you know, not, not yet. Offers for other things? I, I get a lot of um, people requesting selfies and they get photos and I just get um, people asking for photos. And we didn't, re- we didn't believe you actually worked for Armageddon. They see me on the street and yeah. they're like, you know, my mother, or my mother, my, yeah, my daughter and my wife, saw you and I'm like, look at this bloke, you know, he can't possibly work for Armour Guard. Yeah. So, um, so they take photos just to prove to them. But yeah. it was even at, um, that's in the QV in the city and I'm in the diesel store and the manager's like, you're the Brownlee guy. <laughs> and so I have to admit, I do love the attention. It's just yeah. been really nice. I'm just really flattered by it all. Um, it hasn't gone to my head or anything. I don't have an ego or anything like that. It's just all good fun. And um, How do you stop yourself from having an ego? Is it, is it, is it, I guess it's if you, if you think about it logically, you know, unless you go out and keep doing something to put yourself in the spotlight, eventually that's yeah, you know, it's going to die down, and people will you know, still know who you are, but you're not going to get that same yeah. rush of, of interest every single every single day. So, I mean, are you uh, planning on? 
keeping yourself in the spotlight or are you content to just be Wes and yeah like, I'm content to just go back to my normal life I mean I've, I, like, I've enjoyed the attention and, um, you know I don't really rate myself um, did you update your Tinder profile with <laughs> Mr Brownlow or something uh, no, uh, <laughs> not do that. Although it has been suggested um, that I do that, but it wouldn't be something that I'm I'm into really. So it's all right. Yeah. Um, so how okay? How how many? You said you've done thirty comps. Yeah, there are about. I'm starting to lose count. It's getting okay. up there. Mm. Uh, Wayne Wilson's done eighty something. Yeah. He's he's you know he's he does does everything. Um, is there a point where you think you know enough is enough? I'm just gonna rest of my laurels is there a show that you want to win and say yep that's it I'm happy to retire or is it just something that you want to keep doing until I think it's something breaks down on you? definitely uh, well hopefully the body doesn't never breaks down but um, you know when I see people like Dexter Jackson and uh, and even Kevin Lavroni came back this year mm. um, and he's in his 50s um, that certainly inspires me and says you know age is just a number and you can certainly well, continue recently I, I actually I was thinking about Dexter Jackson going geez you know, he's been around for a long time and I know that he'd won a lot of pro comps. Mm. And I looked up on uh, on the internet and just went through and, and saw all of the different shows that he's won. And then I saw the day after, apparently he won, uh, wasn't the show in Kuwait, it was another one. It might yeah. have been the Arnold Classic Europe or something. And that put him at number one for the all-time most IFBB pro wins. Wow. I thought, shit, yeah, okay, he's been, an, he's been sort of consistently... Um, at the top of his game mm. for 15 years, 20 years. Yeah. You know, he's, he's, he was around in the mid-90s and he's still doing it now. Mm. And you think, geez, all right, that's that's real persistence and dedication. I guess there's a lot of other things that you sort of have to put by the wayside and you maybe deny yourself a lot of experiences in, in pursuit of that goal. Yeah. But, um, you know, when you're in your late 40s 10 years from now would, yeah. is that sort of well yeah I guess the difference of, between uh, myself and Dexter is um, well, he gets paid to do what he does um, so I can see his drive there and why would you want to do anything else when you're as good as he is at what he does um, for me um, I think when I stop placing in shows yeah. um, I'll probably give it away I don't think I ever want to do a Masters contest I always want to do the Open <laughs> contest I remember uh, Graham said to me, he goes, oh, if you do the WFF, you know, class two, he goes, because you're over 35 now, you can um, do the Masters. Let someone else win the uh, the class two. And I'm sort of like, yeah, yeah, fair call, but no. I actually, <laughs> well, I just want to continue in the open classes and, yeah. and compete well, with the There's, the there's a lot of guys that, that have that, that thinking. I don't know, um, like Dave Cutler's, he's 43, 44, I think. Um, yeah, he's and, incredible. And it was, mm. but it, yeah, it was suggested to him, oh, you just do the do the Napa Masters. He's like, yeah, but no, but I don't want to. I'm still competitive in the Opens. And and that's, you know, there's not that many, um, yeah, I guess it's it's tough when you look at that and you go, geez, all right, there's there's so many awesome Masters age competitors, guys over 40, something, you know, in their 50s, and they're fantastic. Um, But they don't want to do Masters because they sort of have this mental picture of, oh, the Masters is where you, what you do when you're sort of being put out to pasture yeah um, but of course if you see the you know, I don't know if you actually saw the um, the Masters over 50 at the WFF Universe were you around oh, well, for that? possibly backstage to be honest with you I don't tend to watch the shows when some I'm of those guys them. were I think the, uh, there was a the, I can't remember what his name was um, Pala Mikai I think he was Thai um, you could have put him in the opens and he would have cleaned up yeah and even the guys who came second and third they were all fantastic and you look at them and go you wouldn't really believe these guys are over 50 yeah looking at them um but I suppose that there's a point at which you say alright well either I'm going to keep doing this at the very top level or I'm going to scale it back a little bit and look after my health a bit more because the things that we do when we're 25 and 30 and 35 <laughs> once we get to 45 and 50 and 55 it's, it takes a toll on your on your body yeah. Um, there's probably other things that you sort of want to focus on. Well, the other thing is, um, I guess, like when you're single as well, mm. I mean, you can do this sort of stuff. I mean, if I was to have a family, I'd definitely make that my priority and it wouldn't be, certainly wouldn't be doing six shows in one year. Yeah. Um, 
Hey, it's Picky Mark do one show and yeah. yeah. So for me now, I mean, uh, I just really want to win a universe. I win the pro in the universe yeah. uh, one day. I'm just going to keep climbing the hill and, and fighting um, until I get there, um, and I will. Yeah. Um, I this is the first time touch wood that I haven't been injured for okay. um, a period of time. I think I've gone a whole year without any injuries, and I'm planning on keeping <laughs> it that way. Um, obviously. Train a lot smarter these days. I don't yeah. do too much maximum overload. I tend to uh, focus on correct form and contractions, and um, I've been getting good results doing that. Yeah. Um, obviously, I'm still progressing. I mean, I've never been 104 kilos before, um, and I've you know literally put on 10 kilos um, of contest weight um, of lean muscle um, in 12 months, and that's just from application mm. um, dedication and just um, not skipping meals just taking myself more seriously and and um, you know if, if I'm gonna have my name associated with um, you know being a professional I'm gonna be um, you take it seriously yeah I'm yeah. gonna be an ambassador for the sport and I'm gonna make sure people say well you know what he looks like one so uh, so it's probably an interesting thing about you know professional bodybuilders these mm. days where there's so few people in the industry in and you know considering all of the different bodybuilding organizations that exist around the world and all of the different organizations that have a pro league or a pro division or a pro status that they can award um, the majority of people who have that pro card or that pro status they still go to work every day they still have a job you know it's like all right well yeah you still got to do something that keeps you funded um, and I think about it almost like golf. You know, you think of how many pro golfers there are around yeah. the world, and most of them still have to go to work. They're not making, you know, they're not Tiger Woods and that one percent where they can make millions and millions of dollars off sponsorship deals and every time they, you know, enter a, a contest. Um, I mean, do, do people come up to you? Oh, you're a pro bodybuilder. And you're like, yeah, but I'm still a guy. I still have to go to work. I still, you know, cook my own meals. That's and, true. They, they do you know, think that. Um that's it, you don't have to work anymore. And I was like, no, actually I do. And uh, yeah, I do work 12 hours a day and um, it's um, challenging. Um, but you know, I think this is what separates the, uh, the champions from the non-champions is having the ability to, um, you know, do that. Like, you know, there's gonna be days you don't feel like training and it's cold and it's wet outside and you're low calories and there's different things and speed bumps that are going to get in your way and you just have the, the, the guts and the heart to just go and push yourself and um, and um, that's what I love, you know, because if it was easy, um, everyone would be doing it and they don't and there's only a few guys at the top mm. and uh, and I just like to be one of them, you know, so I'll do what it takes. Is that one of those, uh, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a long road, yeah. And you know, people don't realise how much you have to sacrifice in order to get to the top in bodybuilding, whether it's amateur or professional, or it doesn't matter you know, what organisation. There's a, a certain amount of um, dedication, and I know, you just got to yeah, put everything else to one side. Yeah, and and, while, while and you, knowledge as well, because I mean it's. Possible bodybuilding is probably the hardest sport I've ever tried because, I mean, it's, it doesn't start and end in the gym. You know, anyone can go in and throw weights around yeah. for an hour, and you, you see guys in there and, and girls, and five years passes and they've made no progress at all. And um, it's because of what you have to do after your workout. You know, you have your post-workout nutrition, and you need to be consistent with those meals. And you know. Um, do you eat six or seven times a day, or are you at least seven times a day? I mean, sometimes, I mean, I'll wake up at two in the morning and cook a steak. Like if I'm hungry, I mean, I'll do it. Do you, you know? I remember was it was it was in New Zealand. You said that the um, was it your microwave blew up or something, or your, oh, your it was George the, Foreman blew up on you? Man, New Zealand, that was the worst experience ever. <laughs> um, well, firstly, I'll leave all our stuff in the beginning there. My food gets confiscated at the. Um, at the airport before you, even what were, trying, what were you trying to bring in? Oh, some almond butter or something that's just ridiculous and they considered it to be a gel. So, um, All right. they wouldn't let me take it and um, 
yeah, it just escalated from there. Um, so anyway, when I got to the, the hotel, and this was a carb load day, so I actually needed um, all my food, and I actually went about seven hours without any food, and Oof. finally got to the registration, and I just kind of pushed to the front, and I yeah. said, look, you know, this is me, here, I'm going. <laughs> um, I finally found a supermarket after walking up the street in the rain for about half an hour, and um, when I came back, to my hotel room, I plugged my George Foreman in, I finally kicked off my shoes, I was like, oh, maybe I can relax, you know? And um, it blew up. <laughs> and then the, obviously the fuses blew and then the microwave, you know, blew as well. And so I had no food, I had all this fresh meat and chicken and steak and oats and rice and I couldn't even cook it. Um, so uh, I was kind of stuck. It was probably the worst prep experience I've ever had. But you just have to deal with it, and um, yeah, that's they, the tall. They didn't end up. They didn't know. They didn't need to give you a new room, though, did they? They fixed. No, that well, I, I actually asked for a new room, and um, they said, "Yeah, well, that's no problem, but you can pay for this one, and you can pay for the next one." Ooh. And then um, I thought, "Oh, that's not going to happen." And then what she said was, um, did you, "Well, you didn't have a kitchen in your room, did you?" No, I didn't. So I had. Was like that why they were like, "Yeah, we're, we're not going to give you a free room because you yeah, well, I said <laughs> plug in cooking equipment." I said to them, "Look, I'll, I'll have one with the kitchen, and I was happy to pay for that, but not yeah. both the rooms." And then she said, "Look, I'll get the chef to cook your food for you." And I said, "How nice!" Yeah, what was that anyway? Um, I said, she took the my chicken, and then um, I got it back about two hours later. So um, <laughs> it wasn't like I said; it wasn't the the greatest, um, you know upload day or prep day or that's okay these things happen and it's still uh, it had pretty good condition I thought I didn't really yeah. let it bother me too much and um, I guess you know, you know there's a certain amount of adversity like yeah you, you want a bit of an uphill battle but you don't want it to completely derail what you're trying to do yeah. you still need things to go smoothly exactly um, what do you what do you generally eat on your your on days are you, are you a fish and fish and brown rice or fish and you know, I, I, pro I probably, I'm actually, fish has been suggested to me, actually, because um, apparently the oil's in it are good for getting that really thin skin, but I've actually been eating a lot of chicken, and mm -hmm. uh, I probably made a mistake with eating too much steak, actually. I was eating okay. two steaks a day, okay. every day, a kilo of chicken yeah. a day, probably Jesus. two kilos of um, broccoli, and I didn't cut my carbs at either. I used to have about two carb meals as well. Um, I actually never felt like I was on a diet. I actually felt like I was... So, yeah, if you're eating two steaks things. a day, you'd be... Yeah, and half a jar of peanut God, butter. Jeez. So, <laughs> have like, you had your cholesterol checked? I haven't. So I'm assuming it's okay. Um, <laughs> but, um, Schrodinger's cholesterol. I kept telling know. myself that um, yeah, this is a bodybuilding contest, not a dieting contest. And yeah. um, and I was I was pretty hard. I still had a little feathering through my quads and stuff. Mm. But, I mean, I could certainly have been a lot better. That's for sure. Have you ever thought of getting a coach? Is that, I mean, I don't know if someone suggested that to you, but I know a lot of guys who have coaches or, or um, maybe not necessarily with a diet, but someone to sort of give you a little bit of extra help with your, your comp prep. I think it's a great idea, um, but I haven't... I guess if you're used to doing your own thing, it's very difficult to suddenly take the advice of someone else who maybe doesn't know your story, they don't know what you've been through, they don't really know your metabolism as well as you do, so. That's what makes it hard for me to understand um, with coaches, like, you know, a lot of them have never competed before and they don't know the emotional stress yeah. that you go through when you're on a diet. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of reluctant to trust people. I have a couple of close friends that compete and they do bring the condition in really well. Yeah. So I usually would ask, like, I don't ask for guidelines, but um, they're usually very helpful. Mm -hmm. And I think that, like you said before, I've had some success and uh, I do nail it. And um, my condition is always good yeah. um, and I can take it to another level. Um, and that's how I win shows is through condition mainly because I'm, like I said, I'm not an overly large guy. Um, but I would like to keep myself open to um, the possibility of having a coach. Um, but I think, like particularly this year, was the first year I actually um, was able to just eat more and mm -hmm. just make it a priority like I thought, you know what, 
you really got to take this seriously. I mean, there was obviously in the past I'd have weekends off and, um, you know, I'd go away or something or not eat as frequently as I should. I only have two or three meals in a day. and But now I don't allow that to happen. Now that I've, um, you know, I'm taking it a lot more seriously. I am, um, you know, I don't skip meals ever. You, know. you said before you used to be a chef. That's true. So where did that start? And where... Why? Why are you not still a chef? I mean, obviously you don't you don't lose the skills and the the know how, but yeah, being a professional chef, it's like it's a pretty demanding job, I guess. I thought like being a chef obviously it presents the opportunity to travel, which I did do when I did work overseas as well. Um, the hours are very hectic, and um, it's rewarding, like on a um, personal level, but it's not really that rewarding financially or. And you certainly don't. Um, your social life suffers in a big way, and it doesn't. And it doesn't allow you to. Um, yeah, you can't go to weddings and birthdays and different things like that. And I thought to myself, you know what? I'm, I'm young. Well, I was at the time, and I thought, um, I think I actually want to enjoy my weekends. I actually want to do some stuff, and I wanted to play football. And um, it was stopping me from doing that. And then also with the bodybuilding, um, it was making because it's very hot it's very stressful you're running around i think it was about 70 kilos when i was a chef it was just yeah, ridiculous wow. because it was so busy yeah you know you just eat the edge off a brownie you just made or you'd have a couple <laughs> of spoonfuls of ice cream out of the fridge or something you actually don't eat well chefs yeah. don't eat well at all and um or you think you're going to cook yourself a meal and you turn the grill off and then you're like oh i'm not turning it back on again yeah. Do you know what I mean? coming you, 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 you see you cereal go, twice you, a day. You just go home and go, I could, I could make something really nice, but I don't care. Piece of toast. Some yeah, bowl of cereal. Bowl of cereal. Yeah. Tin spaghetti, just stuff it. <laughs> that's, I don't care. It's, that's pretty know. much how it works. Because um, you just really, because you, it's, it's your job to cook and you just don't want to do it when you come home. Um, but like now, I've got those skills yeah. and I want it to be on the other side of the pass. Yeah. And now I enjoy going to restaurants and different things mm. and also um, I can entertain at home can you can you do that thing where you, you cut vegetables really quickly without cutting your hands open yeah because yeah. I can't do that. can't do that I either do it really really slowly or I do it like I know sort of how to hold a knife properly but I yeah. don't think I've got knives that will allow me to I don't yeah. have proper chef's knives I've got the old Wiltshire yeah you know. that's never going to work um, <laughs> but I, I actually, have to go knife shopping yeah I still have the proper chef knives and uh, I think what we used to do because um, we're always under the pump was um, race the clock. So, okay. you know, you got to chop this box of broccoli and we yeah. just try to do it in like three minutes or something or with Julian and carrots and different things like that. So you do learn to become very fast very quickly yeah. and I've still managed to, I can still do that. So I can, I can show off a little bit, right. you know. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's probably one thing that there's not that much of in bodybuilding mm -hmm. is bodybuilders showing, you know, prospective competitors how to prepare a meal. Cause I, like I, I remember seeing a mate of mine um, cook an omelette years ago, and like you know, growing up in a house full of bodybuilders, I, I know how to whisk eggs yeah. blindfolded, mm -hmm. but he clearly just didn't give a shit at this point. He was tired and he just needed to eat three eggs, and he basically just cracked them open and in a pan, gave him a bit of a stir. And it's this weird tie dye looking yellow and, <laughs> and white omelette thing. I'm like, man, do you want to, you know, mix that up, maybe? Put some, put a bit of salt in there. He's like, no, nah, I don't care. I really don't. Care. And I'm like, I'm, I'm convinced it was mostly just because he didn't know really how to prepare an omelette properly. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. There, I mean, like um, the people that I've met too, uh, they've got no idea how to um, cook their chicken and um, or their steaks and things like that. They but he set their hotel rooms on fire. But um, yeah, I actually make my diet food taste really good. Yeah, and. Um, I've had people come over that were also dieting and I'd, I'd cook for them also and they're like, this doesn't even taste like diet food. And there wouldn't be salt in it. There wouldn't yeah. be um, What do you use instead of salt? Is it well, just the herbs and spices? That yeah, you I mean, you know, tarragon and, and, and chicken, like... Oh, that's like, the best. They're best friends. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of people yeah. don't like tarragon. It's, it was one of those weird herbs that no one really gets into. It's quite, I think it's probably bigger in America than it is here, but... Um, yeah. I love tarragon and chicken. That's that's a great combination. I think so too. Um, so you know, I come up with that sort of stuff. There's also a lot of fat burning spices. You know, you've got your, obviously your your cinnamons and your paprika and your turmeric and your cumin, and they have like um, other benefits too with for your digestion and and uh, so I mean, I just use that and just 
balance it well. Um, and obviously the experience um, pays off. Um, but you want to keep things easy and simple. And, you know, we do eat for function, not flavour. Um, but I, I'm fortunate enough to balance the two. And uh, What's your favourite thing to cook for yourself? For myself? Like when I'm dieting or when I'm... Oh, okay, well, when, you're, when you're dieting, what's your go-to, you know, favourite meal? I really like... I really like steaks, even though I said I shouldn't be eating them. Yeah. Um, and I usually have, like... I get a lot of exotic mushrooms and stuff like okay. that, and I just grill them and have some, like, just grilled vegetables and stuff yeah. like that. Um, well, with a steak, mm. what's your advice for the best steak, the best way to cook a steak? Because a few people... Like, I know people have got different... different uh, theories on this here should only turn it once or you got to have a certain oh, type of heat or whatever yeah definitely you definitely only turn steaks once um, if you um, you know what you can't go past those grills they're really those those George Foreman grills yeah. they're, they're pretty good I mean they, they can dry your food if you don't get the timing right um, but if you're doing it in the pan that works quite well and um, you would only turn it once and it just depends on the size of your steak mm. um, you know I get pretty big ones yeah. but um Probably, so I got I got a thick cut, a two thick cut um, Scotch fillets the other night. Yeah, and I found that I had to turn them a couple of times to make sure that they were evenly cooked. And then I I actually uh, got a pair of tongs and I put one on top of the other, wedged them, or put the tongs around it, pulled the tongs out, and had to sear the sides. Yep. Otherwise, the whole thing would be it'd right. be raw around. <laughs> it was like a okay. really big steak. Yeah, I get the feeling that your your heat was too high. I would have it on a, a low to medium. Heat. But things like scotch fillets, there's usually yeah. a fair bit of fat yeah. marbling yeah. in them, and you really have to render that down. Yeah. So, but but, I, I love to cook, cook steak on a high heat. I like it black and charred. Yeah. And that's, have you, have you ever cooked steak over a fire? Um, I have. Well, on a barbecue, I guess, over that type yeah. of flame. But I think you can still get a nice crust on your steak if mm. you, because you can turn the heat up a bit later too. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So, um, I like to dust them with, um, some spices okay. and you don't want to have it too high because you can burn it you burn people season the food before they um, cook it and you can burn pepper yeah. and stuff yeah. like that so but I understand your um, your desire to have um, the black like a blackened steak but it um, if you if it's a thick cut mm. well the middle's going to be raw yeah. and the medium rare is nice it was, nice, it was but, pink by the, by the time I guess yeah. by the time I'd finished with it it was pink because I I did turn it a few times and mm. tried to get the sort of even, even cook on either side. Yeah. Um, but it's all practice. It's yeah. I mean, I, look, I guess I've probably cooked that many steaks over the years that I'm not. Even if I am cooking for someone else, I don't really give a shit. Like, you can't, <laughs> I don't know if you can taste the difference between a steak that's been turned twice or once or whatever. Although I definitely like, I've cooked steaks over a wood fire flame. I've got a little um, a little fire pit in the backyard. St- st- stack it up with wood. Put the got the grill thing that sits over the top of that. Oh, yeah. Stake over that and get the can of canola oil and just give it a spray every now and again. It really brings the flame up. Yep. And I tell you what, that's the best food. That's the, anything cooked over wood fire for me is just delicious. All right. Cooked salmon over wood fire too once. That was surprisingly really good. Okay. I thought it was going to fall apart into the fire, but no. Nah. But yeah, <laughs> terrific. So, <laughs> well, you're uh, you're on your off season favorite meal. Still staying. I I'm, I'm a bit of a sweet tooth actually. Actually, I've got a whole set. Um, so I really like desserts and yeah. cream custard type of things. And actually, I'm partial to making desserts too. So I actually like uh, making vanilla slices and. And uh, we'll even brownies. I mean, that's not really cooking, is it? Because that's easy stuff. That's just a batter, banana See, bread. So you say and that, stuff like you say that. that, but for some people, that's really difficult. It's really difficult, yeah. <laughs> to make a good one, I guess um, it is. I'm a bit of a cake freak, you know. I love okay. cakes. And uh, you, you get into Zumbo's. Uh, did you watch that by any chance? I no, I didn't. It was too frustrating for me. To, I don't like all the drama, that cinematic behaviour. <laughs> um, I don't like Master Chef or any of that stuff that everyone's into. Um, you know, my favourite pastry shop would be uh, B&P, which is on Chapel Street. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's he's better than better than Zumbo, that's for sure. Darren Purchase, world champion. So that's I go there. Play. First place I go after um, after a comp, because yeah. I know it's guaranteed good. 
hundred percent of the time. Do you um, do you ever think to yourself, "Geez, I, I really just overdone it on food." Yeah. Do you ever sit there and just like eat way too much? Yeah, it's like, what have I done to myself? <laughs> and uh, and um, just uh, I don't know if it's physiological or psychological or. But what happens generally is when you're dieting and uh, you in that deprivation, you think to yourself, "Ooh, you know, what am I missing? What am I craving?" and for some reason, I feel the need to eat all of it at once and not just um, a space that over a week or something like that. So it's, uh, and I often go to, sometimes I've been to buffets and stuff. Like when I was in New Zealand, I stayed at um, the Langham. Uh, I went to the buffet and I thought, oh, I'll try everything. And I ate everything and then I came home and I had a full distension and I was like, oh. I can't even lie down. If I lie down, I'm going to throw up. I just had to like sit down and just wait. I think I waited about three hours before I went Ooh. to bed and I was just, just suffering all night and I just promised myself I'd never do that again. Um, but sometimes you do and you don't learn. So the first few shows I did that, but now I'm pretty good. Now that's why I'd, I do those more refined, fine dining experiences where meals are spaced out and I might have, if it's a degustation, there might be six or seven courses or three courses with yeah. good space between and then I just control myself, go to bed and then go out somewhere nice for breakfast the following morning and that's generally enough. And I like to stay in shape too, you yeah. know, so post-comp, I don't want to blow up like a, a balloon and get big water retention on the ankles and things like that. It's never a good feeling, never a good look and you feel pretty feel like or, pretty ordinary as well, yeah. You don't coach anyone, do you? No. Um, people suggested and asked me, I'm happy to help people and give mm. them free advice and some guidelines but I'm not, Really qualified to. Um, it's funny, like, like I, I interviewed Rob Bagonner a little while mm. ago, and he said more or less the same thing that no, nah, he he doesn't coach people. He's happy to give people advice and talk to them, but he doesn't see himself as a comp prep coach, mm. and he doesn't feel that he's qualified. And I'm like, hang on, you know, you guys have been competing for probably around the same number of years, twelve years. Yeah. I think he might be a bit more. Yeah, about, I think uh, twelve yeah. years, maybe thirteen, fourteen years. Mm. And I think you know, you know, how long do you have to be in the game? Before you say, "All right, I know what I'm talking about." Yeah. Well, I'd... and I mean, you know, like it's probably all credit to you. You've been in it for a very long time. And you're like, "Yeah, I'm not qualified." Other people get into it. They do one show, and suddenly they're a yeah, insta- a, they're a guru. They're a guru. Oh, no. yeah. um, insta famous. That's true. And I, I what can I, how do I say this? Um, Be as offensive as you like. Yeah. It well, it, it's certainly it's a saturated industry, and I do see a lot of. PTs getting around and coaches um, that don't know what they're doing and I really don't want to be associated or be one of them or considered to be one of them. It's not something that I would be proud of, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but look, I think if you were if you were coaching someone... Mm. Um, See, a lot of guys... No one would days. go, away. he doesn't know what he's talking about, he hasn't done anything. Yeah. At least, you know, yeah, you've competed, you've done 30 shows and you've been competing for 10 years and or 12 years and... Yeah, the proof's in the pudding. You know, you know what you're talking about. Yeah, well, at least I've done it. You know what I mean? And I can say, well, why don't you, you know, prep for someone that actually does it themselves yeah. and can, uh, you know, um, give you some good guidance. Um, but at the moment, I mean, um, I see most people as competition too, so yeah, I keep some of my secrets to myself. Yeah. But um, I see a lot of guys these days are prepping women, yeah. um, candy girls and stuff like that, and... Uh, um, that wouldn't be so bad, <laughs> I guess. Have you had many? Uh, have you had anyone contacting you on Facebook saying, "Can you, <laughs> can you get me ready after, after this week?" You had that sort of that sort of interest, or has I it mostly been? You know what? I haven't had anyone contact me um, on Facebook to get them ready, but I have been approached in the gym numerous times uh, by both males and females, um, just saying that they weren't satisfied. Yeah with what the coaches were doing and uh, some male coaches giving, you know, female bikini competitors advice and giving them the same diet that they were on, mm. which makes no sense to me. Um, and I just would say to them, look, I'm happy to give you some guidance, but um, certainly don't go wasting your money yeah. on a coach. I could even show you how to pose if you want to. Yeah. I mean, I can... Well, that's, that's the thing. I mean, mm. like in the old days, and I'm, you know, I'm, th- I'm nearly 30, but yeah. Yeah, in the old days, um, People wouldn't have posing coaches. You might go, you know, be you and a couple of mates who are all competing. You'd go and you'd do 
posing together and you'd talk about the finer points of it together. Yeah. Um, I guess people probably probably pose a lot better now than they did 20 years ago. In, in some cases, I mean, I think that there's a lot of people who don't really know what the fuck they're doing now. <laughs> they didn't know what they're doing back then. Yeah. Um, but even with, you know, diet and training and that, there wasn't really that culture of uh, elite coaching within bodybuilding. It was just people trained at the gym and then someone happened to be, you know, the oldest of that gang. <laughs> and the person who was the oldest and had been doing the longest would probably give the advice to the younger ones yeah. or the, the newer competitors. And that was sort of that was sort of it. Nowadays, it's just, yeah, it's a free-for-all. Everyone's got their team of bodybuilders and, or team of competitors. And um, I think it's sort of nice to having that sort of team environment. Yeah. But it's not a team sport. And no. it was not, I mean, Dad says it's not a sport. It's a lifestyle, I think. Yeah. That's probably the, the distinction between bodybuilding, competitive bodybuilding, and bodybuilding as a lifestyle. That you know, if you're building a stable of competitors, um, you still got to understand that it's a stable of individuals. Not a, you know, everyone's not all competing, hoping everyone's going to get first because everyone can't get first. It's really, yeah, people have got to put themselves ahead of ahead of that. I mean, do you? Do you ever go overseas and you feel kind of well, not lonely, but what do you? Yeah, you ever compete and think, "Geez, I'd, I'd love to have that team atmosphere of four or five other people all wearing the same jacket." And well, that's been happening recently. Um, you know, I think you know with um, you know the WFF and now the Federation, like it's a pretty tight knit group, and um, everyone sort of supports each other and. Um, you know, the Australians want to stick together, which is really nice. Um, so this is where you actually make these friends that you don't expect yeah. to make because you, you get over there, you haven't really... Because they've come from, you know, four or five suburbs away yeah. um, or interstate and um, you never met them before and then um, you go away and you come back and you're like best friends with them yeah. um, and the most unlikely people mm. too that you, would, you wouldn't suspect that you would actually become friends with. But... Um, you know, so yes, um, you, I do actually get to experience that where I'm wearing the jacket and getting yeah. photos. Together I guess and now that you now that you're pretty much focusing on international level comps, yeah, it's a bit different yeah. if you're going overseas and you're always going to be with an Australian team. Yeah, um, I guess you don't have to put up with that you know local level stuff backstage where someone's got their group of athletes and they're all sitting in the one area being yeah. a little click. And I think the only time I ever felt a little bit of an outsider was. Um, Probably back in 2004 when I was, I actually did about five shows up there that year and I was at the Muscle Mania World and, yeah. uh, in California. And like I said, uh, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just fortunate enough to have good enough genetics to get by on, uh, you know, eating whatever I was eating. And um, I remember turning up and I was just seeing all these really big guys and really hard guys and I just had a good look at myself and I thought, you know Muscle Mania is natural, isn't it? It is supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't think it exists in Australia anymore, but... Um, I think they do like one show a year or two shows a year. There's like the Muscle Mania Australian Championships as a pro qualifier or something. Okay. It's a bit like the WBFF. Not, not exactly the same, but it's got that kind of... that feel to it that they're mm. not focused on having 20 shows a year... Yeah. And saturating the market, they just hit their one, one big event, and it's yeah, yeah it is what it is. But. So I remember looking around and just um, and just thinking to myself, I never want to have this feeling again. You yeah. know, actually, were you, were you there on your own? Or was I, there, a team? I, there was a couple of the guys. Um, Aaron Smith was one of the the good junior bodybuilders at the time. Mm. Um, Brendan Field and Warren Clampett were there. Yeah. And uh, so I did spend some time with those guys. Um, but they're on different levels as well. To me, Warren and uh, Brendan were quite advanced. Um, Aaron was um, really advanced for his age, being a junior. So um, when we Warren won the Natural Olympia a couple, yeah. three times or something? Yeah, or I think he's yeah. professional in the NBA yeah. and everything. He's, uh, he's really... He's not, he's, he doesn't still compete now, does he? No, I've I haven't really, seen him around. Yeah, I remember seeing him... Oh, it wasn't quite 10 years... Oh, actually, maybe it was 10 years ago. Was that... Um, actually, no, you know where I saw him? Because I, when was the last time you did the IFBB Victorian show? 
Because I remember you competed. You still had long hair. Yeah. You did had a uh, New York minute. It was yeah. Oh <laughs> yeah, I've used that one for a while now. <laughs> and um, I just remember. I remember saying hello to you. It was it was at it was at the the uh, the Freemasons in uh, East Melbourne. Oh uh, yeah. At the Dallas Brooks Centre before they tore it down. Maybe 2006 or seven. Yeah, it was like yeah, it was around that. I think yeah. it might have even been. Might have, uh, it wasn't it wasn't the Australian Pro Show because it was definitely a, a state a state show that Dowie yeah. had there, um, and I remember seeing Warren Clampett there, mm. and I, like, I'd never met him, I'd never really seen him, but I was surprised at how tall he was. But I mean, people w- always used to accuse him of being on gear and yeah. not being natural, and I'm looking at him like, okay, like he's a he's a big bloke, but he's not like 130 kilos. I mean, no, considering his was, height, he was... He was still under 90 kilos. And yeah. uh, I mean, I knew Warren quite well and, and Brendan and Aaron. And I guess um, they're all at different various stages were accused of um, taking substances. But I mean, I can honestly say that they weren't. You know, it was... Um, I just knew them too well, you know, like I hung yeah. out with them a lot. And, um, and they actually inspired me to, you know, be natural also. Yeah. Um, because if they can do it, and they yeah. can just do it with just through hard work and discipline, and um, so can I, yeah, and so can anyone, yeah. So, um, I think, and that's a good point that there's a. It's all. It's really disheartening to see young guys and girls uh, getting into bodybuilding mm. and basically jumping straight onto gear. Yeah. You know, you, you, they'll be eighteen, seventeen, and they'll be juicing more than some of the pros because I think that's what they have to do. And by the time they're 22, 23, they're either destroying their insides or you know, mentally they just become basket cases. And there's a lot of, you know, there's more and more examples of young bodybuilders who get way too deep way too quickly and they're just falling off the rails. Yeah, I think obviously um, people are just impatient. It's just this world that we live in, this fast paced world. and. Everybody wants everything yesterday, and um, people um, aren't really prepared to work hard at stuff. They think it's going to be easy, but I don't think that's kind of the point of bodybuilding, though, isn't it? You know, it's, it's you know you're not just training for a short term goal. You're training to be, I suppose, yeah. The, the long term aspect of bodybuilding is yeah. trying to be fit and healthy over over the course of your life, so that you're a functional member of society, and that you feel good, and you, you're able to get up in the morning and you know, be yeah. productive. That's true. I, I actually don't think people think too much about the future these days. They're looking at what they're doing next week and, um, and that's it, you know. So, I mean, even the... Because um, what's big at the moment, the men's fitness or something, where they wear board yeah. shorts. I mean, uh, you know, guys are getting jacked up for that too. It makes no sense yeah. to me, you know. But look... I, I can understand that if you if you're doing that as a stepping stone to, you know, open bodybuilding. Yeah. There's, yeah, that, and, that, and that's especially for the younger guys. Like, you know, if you're if you're a, a good you know teenage competitor or a junior competitor, and then you have to go into the open classes, and the guys are all 10, 15 kilos heavier than you. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes it can be beneficial to you know, work into a different class, get into that yeah. structure, and then build build yourself up over a number of years. I think that's always, from our perspective with the WFF, that was always what we wanted because... There it's a were, natural alternative. Yeah, well, yeah, but yeah. I mean, there were, there were guys who were great juniors and as soon as they were 21, they weren't juniors anymore and they couldn't go in the NABRA open classes. They just get demolished yeah. because all these guys are 35, 45, whatever, and they've been, you know, 30, 30 kilos heavier than the juniors. Yeah. So having the WFF stream there to allow for people to move into an open system where... It's not all about mass, but you can build yourself up over a number of years and more or less graduate from a, a weight restricted class into a non weight restricted class where yeah. you know, it, it'll, it gives you that wiggle room. Yeah. I think a lot of people have sort of come on board with that. But for, for I guess, yeah, for a lot of junior guys, they see the end result, they don't see all of the work in between. That's right. Um, and, you know, genetics play a huge role in your development also so you know like steroids aren't necessarily the answer they might put a bit of icing on the cake but I don't think um, often with uh, comps you're trying to make weight 
Uh, I know that most of my competitions I was always too heavy anyway, so it wouldn't have been beneficial for me. Um, uh, but um, you know, um, now with the the pro lineup, I mean, uh, it's it's like a free for all, isn't it? Yeah. There's just there's tall guys, short guys, um, well, but you know they're not going for the largest guy though. They're going for the most aesthetically pleasing, and yeah. so um, I guess it still applies. I mean, well, well mm. I guess our, the philosophy has always been it's not the the biggest, it's not the best conditioned it's the person with the least defects in their physique yeah and if you happen to be the best conditioned and you happen to be the biggest and you happen to be the most complete proportion wise well then great you're probably going to be the winner mm. but if you're the biggest guy on stage and you're fat or you're you're the biggest and you're you know your legs are too big for your upper body yeah. well sorry you you know there's probably going to be someone smaller than you who's going to be better than you because yeah. you know look at rob begonna and he's mm. yeah he's 68 kilos 69 kilos on stage yeah but he's not there's no real weak points in his physique. No, he's he's, a, he's pretty he's, very lucky he's that a, way. He's a genetic marvel. He's a, an exceptional athlete, um, and you know, good on him for because he I know that he works hard and applies himself. Um, so he's, a, he's certainly a great role model um, for other bodybuilders and um, smaller guys yeah. too. You know, like it just goes to show you that anyone mm. can do it. You know, I guess yeah. Around, I'm, I've always sort of been like like that a bit. I've you know, got short limbs. Yeah, don't have to move the bar very <laughs> very yeah, much. So you're very very yeah, strong. That's lucky, good. Lucky like that. Yeah, tall guys tend to struggle a little bit to get that thickness, don't they? Um, but um, that's the way it goes. Yeah. All right. So, bit of a question out of left field. Yep. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen inside the actor's studio, but I like to throw a curveball question to people at the end of uh, end of talking to them. Um, if heaven exists and you make it up there at the end of your life, what would you like God to say to you? Um, you did good, maybe. I don't know. You probably have to edit that one. No, I like that. I like, that. like that. That's good. Um, it's a tough one isn't it? because um, I do want to um, leave a legacy, mm. you know. So, um, and uh, I want to, you know, I like to help people and do things for people. And um, yeah, um, you know, you're all right. I don't know, something. <laughs> You're right. You're all right. Yeah. Yeah. So all right, how can people get in touch with you? Have you got you got Facebook? Yeah, I've got Facebook. It's just my name, which is um, Wesley, you know, Wesley Newell. Newell. And my Instagram is just uh, WES underscore uh, Newell. Um, so, you know. No uh, Twitter? I don't have Twitter. I'm not very tech savvy. I'm not very good on computers and things like that. So it's, even uh, Instagram is brand new for me. So um, I think I said a couple of I think I, you, I saw the the pic from the brown like you put that up. I put that up. I mean, I, I try to keep a little bit different. I don't want it to be all bodybuilding. I want to yeah. show you there is other things I'm interested in. So, yeah. um, but I'm not one of those daily. You don't want to be one dimensional. You know, the same selfie every day with a new motivational quote. That's all bullshit. You know? Here's my ass crack. Are you, uh, yeah. you are you inspired? I know. Hump uh. day. <laughs> leave, leave that to one to the girls. So yeah. All right. Cool. Well, look. Thanks for coming in it's been a pleasure um, and I'll catch you tomorrow at the Victorian Championships you will and hopefully anyone who's listening to this after that time <laughs> will uh, have watched that show as well so we'll see you on stage tomorrow terrific cool thanks mate thank you cheers like I said b- before the episode I don't think I, we kind of got into as much of the deep stuff as we could have had we had more time um, I'm conscious that you know an hour is about right for anyone to pay attention to people talking about bodybuilding. In fact, it may be too long. I don't know. You tell me. Um, if you've got any suggestions, look me up on Facebook, uh, Facebook slash This Is Bodybuilding. Uh, hopefully, you're listening to this on iTunes or SoundCloud. And you can probably leave a comment there too if you like. Um, or you can just hit me up on Facebook. I'm, I'm contactable by everyone in the universe apparently. Because I never get, 
I never get a moment to myself. <laughs> to myself, but that's okay. That's that's what I'm here for to be harassed. But yeah, you you will notice that um, Wes and I talk about what I was. Well, I I interviewed Rob Bagona, who is the WFF Professional Mister Universe reigning champion. Um, I actually interviewed him third, um, but. Obviously, this interview with Wes, which was fifth, is airing before that one. So if you're wondering why I referenced talking to Rob, that's why, because I did talk to him. That episode will be coming up in the next couple of weeks, um, as well as plenty of other great chats I've had with people and will have with people going overseas and, and you know, going to catch up with some close personal friends from around the world and, uh, you know, get their insights onto into uh, what the hell this bodybuilding thing is and, you know, what it all means and, and what they want to do with it and why they get up in the morning and why they keep doing it after all these years. So, you know, there's plenty of stories to tell and we're going to have some fun. Mm-hmm.